in placid skies over central Canada, Air Canada Flight 143 is just past the halfway mark of its journey from Montreal to Edmonton, Alberta. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your first officer. The plane is carrying 61 passengers and eight crew members. Beautiful day. Clear temperature of 24 degrees Celsius. It's July the 23rd, 1983. There, that's coming along, huh? Rick Dion is an Air Canada maintenance engineer. I was going to Edmonton with my wife, Pearl, and my young son, Chris, who was four years old. And this was the beginning of a two-week vacation for us. And we were all pretty excited about going on this new airplane. Compliment of the captain. Oh, hey, Rob, thanks. Whenever you want to come up to the flight deck. This was my first flight on a modern 767 as the company had just acquired them. I'll be back in a minute, OK? I was interested in going to the cockpit to see all this new technology fit in with the work that I did on aircraft. The captain on this flight is Bob Pearson. He's 48 years old, and he's spent more than 15,000 hours in the air. His first officer is Maurice Kintel, who has more than 7,000 hours of flying time. Come on in. Pardon me, gentlemen. Rick. I knew Bob Pearson from the uh, small flying club that I attended in St. Lazar, and he was actually one of the local pilots there that used to do some gliding, and he also flew the ultralight lasers. We had uh, departed heading uh, northwest, a nice, clear, sunny day in July. We're flight plan at 39,000 feet. There were a few airplanes that flew that high in, the, in 1983. And we requested 41,000 feet, which got us further above the jet stream out of the west. The crew may have accumulated a lot of hours in the air, but very few in this plane. It's Boeing's latest and most advanced wide-body jet, the 767. An army of microprocessors in the belly of the plane automates so many functions that the flight engineer's job has been eliminated. This is one of four 767s that Air Canada has recently acquired. The plane itself has only 150 hours on it. Quite a difference here, huh? Oh, yeah. Reset on and start here. The cockpit is different in that all the old uh, instrumentation that we're accustomed to, mostly that was all gone. It was all CRT display, like uh, small TV screens. It was a new high-tech airplane, which involved quite a change for the uh, uh, crew and the maintenance personnel, people handling it. This is a new aircraft for both uh, the captain and I. At the time, I had 75 hours on that airplane, so everything was new for me. Pilots and maintenance crews are both still getting to know this airliner. Well, then we get that same condition. Captain Pearson explains to Dion how he handled a small problem with the engines on an earlier flight. It comes back down to low stage and we just carry on. You know, that brings up an interesting... Fuel pressure. Why would that be? Whoa. A warning alerts the crew to critically low pressure at one of the plane's fuel pumps. Something's wrong with the fuel pump. The 767 has three main fuel tanks, two in the wings, which are always used, and one in the center, only used on long-distance flights. Electric fuel pumps draw fuel from each tank and feed it to the plane's two engines. The low-pressure warning could mean that one of the pumps needs maintenance, but it could also be a more serious issue, a lack of fuel to be pumped. A forward fuel pump. It's just a bloody pump failing, I can tell you that. Another low fuel pressure warning sounds. This one from another fuel pump on the plane's left side. Pearson's flight management computer tells him he should have plenty of fuel for the remainder of the trip. The 767 also has separate digital fuel gauges, but on this flight, those gauges are out of service. The warnings don't make sense. It got a little uh, more interesting when the second uh, fuel boost pump light came on for that tank, which was the left tank. This seemed quite abnormal, that two pumps would fail. 
in a brand new airplane. We had some kind of a problem that we didn't understand. What would your assessment of that be? My own personal thoughts? It might be low in the left tank. I used to be involved with uh, transferring fuel, and I know that when you're trying to empty a tank, it'll start flashing periodically, and then the pump will reprime, and then the light will go out. In this case, it appeared to do exactly the same thing. Captain Pearson knows that if the left tank is running low, the right tank may be low as well. Let's head for Winnipeg. Now. Pearson wants to land as soon as possible in case he is running out of fuel. The crew is still more than 700 miles away from their original destination, Edmonton, Alberta. The nearest major airport is Winnipeg, Manitoba, a mere 120 miles away. We're showing lots of fuel on board on our flight management computer and three normal fuel checks cross-checked with our fuel on our flight plan. So we elected to divert the flight to Winnipeg, where Air Canada has a main maintenance base. Winnipeg Center. Air Canada 143. Air Canada 143, go ahead. Ron Hewitt has 20 years experience as a radar controller. Yes, sir, we have a problem. We're going to a requesting direct Winnipeg. Air Canada 143 cleared. Take position, direct Winnipeg. You are cleared to maintain 6,000 descent, your discretion. Send to 6,000 his discretion, and that was it. He didn't tell us what the problem was, and uh, it's none of my business. Give him what he wants, get everybody out of his way. That's about what we do. Okay, we're out of 410. Pearson now begins to descend from 41,000 feet. Oh, man. They're all going out, eh? The low pressure warnings are spreading to more and more of the fuel pumps. Kintel instructs the cabin crew to prepare for an emergency landing. Hello? Cabin? We think we have problems with our fuel system. We are diverting to Winnipeg. All flight attendants to front galley, please. I hope this is just false warnings. Rick, can you think of anything we haven't done? No, I can't, Bob. Okay. We've lost the left engine. Losing an engine erases any doubt. Flight 143 is, in fact, running out of fuel. Okay, checklist, single engine landing. Pearson is trained to land a 767 with one engine. No one has ever tried landing with none. He scrambles to get his plane down so that he doesn't become the first. With only one engine powering Air Canada Flight 143, and with the possibility of the other engine shutting down, the crew prepares the passengers for the worst. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your in-charge flight attendant speaking. Due to mechanical problems, we'll be preparing for an emergency landing. Please return to your seats and fasten your seat belts. Your crew is fully trained to deal with the situation, and as you may have noticed, some crew members have already started to prepare the aircraft. I had no idea, uh, like the rest of my crew members, that there was a problem of fuel. I had no idea why we were going to Winnipeg. Approach and landing. Flaps will be 20. Right. Ground flap override. As they're doing that drill, the right-hand fuel pump low-pressure light was flashing as well, much like it did on the left. They were quite busy carrying out the first engine out, not watching the pump lights, which was right at my eyebrow. So I kind of knew that that one there was going to shut down too. What was that? Very shortly, we will begin giving you instructions.
How come I have no instruments? Our beautiful colored engine and flight instrument displays simply went black. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain calm. Please follow our instructions. Refrain from smoking and put your chair back in the upright position. Secure your seatbelt tightly against your hip. It's exactly what Pearson had feared. He's lost both engines. At 26,500 feet, still 75 miles from the nearest major airport, he's out of fuel. Winnipeg, Air Canada 143. Air Canada 143, go ahead. Just lost both engines. When both engines uh, uh, shut off, uh, I think he said, holy, I'm talking to a dead man. We were trained in the simulator to handle a single engine failure. We had never practiced, and I don't believe most pilots ever get the chance to practice total engine failures. Which we just lost their engines. It's highly unlikely that anybody's going to survive this. Because I could see them trying to make a turn and spinning in. An airplane's engines not only provide thrust, they also generate the power needed to manipulate the plane. It would be completely uncontrollable, but modern airliners are like a Swiss army knife with one last blade hidden away. In the event of a loss of power, they automatically deploy the RAT, or ram air turbine. It's spring-loaded, and the propeller that drives this small hydraulic pump is about the size of a propeller you would see like on a little Cessna 150. And this arm uh, catapults down into the slipstream. This propeller starts to turn, drives this hydraulic pump, and it gives you basic systems. I was pretty quiet uh, flying uh, without motors. Pearson knows that time is running out. He needs directions to the closest landing strip. A 143, this is a mayday, and uh, we require a vector on to the closest available runway. Uh, 143, we copy that all okay. But the loss of the plane's engines has had an unexpected consequence at air traffic control. They're gone. They were right here. We've lost him, he's dropped off the screen. I need primary radar. Uh, 143. Uh, we've lost your transponder return and are attempting to pick up your target now. We work on transponder, it's called secondary radar. We take the pilot signal to paint the aircraft. Commercial jetliners are equipped with a transponder, a device that transmits coded information which air traffic controllers use to determine the plane's location. But when Flight 143 lost its second engine, only a small number of items got backup power. The transponder was not one of them, so the plane disappeared from Hewitt's screen. Flight 143 is somewhere east of Winnipeg, but no one knows exactly where or how far it is from the airport. In spite of its enormous weight, a 767 doesn't plunge from the sky when it loses its engines. Its aerodynamic properties keep it in the air, but slowly coasting to Earth. And I was trying to uh, figure um, how many miles we were moving ahead versus how many thousands of feet we were dropping. But Quintel doesn't have the instruments which provide the information he needs to make that calculation. Since he lost the plane's signal, Hewitt can't give Quintel that information either. Controllers hurriedly work to rig up a way to find the plane. Just before landing, you will hear the command, brace for landing, brace immediately, and stay braced until the plane comes to a complete stop. There are two ways to brace. One, bend forward. Raise your arms and hands against the seat back. Bryce Bell is a businessman on his way home to Edmonton. As soon as they announced that we were making a non-scheduled stop in Winnipeg, I immediately wished I hadn't had the two drinks that I'd had, because I thought, you're going to have a split second here, and this plane's going to explode in flame, and the decision you make in that split second will depend on how alert you are. Okay, please put your personal belongings in the seat back pocket. 
The response of the passengers when we were doing the emergency briefing was basically alert. They were looking at us. They were paying attention to every word we were saying. I couldn't have had better passengers. I think that's him. Let's say that's him. Because their modern equipment can't see Air Canada 143, the controllers switch to old-fashioned radar, which doesn't need a transponder to locate planes. I gotta turn up my true radar, the reflective radar, which is not nearly as good. And we don't use it at all if we can help it. Okay, I got it. 65 from Winnipeg, 45 from Gimli. Uh, 143. We have you at 65 miles from Winnipeg and approximately 45 miles from Gimli. For the first time since losing power, the pilots know their distance to Winnipeg. We might make Winnipeg. Quintel, however, thinks that Gimli is a safer bet. Gimli, Manitoba has a decommissioned Air Force base. It's about 20 miles closer than Winnipeg. As luck would have it, Maurice Kintel trained at Gimli while in the armed forces. He knows it well. 45 miles to Gimli. That is a long runway. Uh, is there emergency equipment at Gimli? Negative emergency equipment at all. Just one runway available, I believe. And uh, no control tower and no information on it. Pearson must consider the possibility of a crash landing. If he has any chance of making it to Winnipeg, which has full emergency support, he knows he must try for it. Okay, then we would prefer Winnipeg. Fine, uh, 143, continue your present heading. We all reacted very businesslike and say something specifically to uh, the situation, but never would we ever look at each other. I think we were all afraid that we might break down. Parents were hugging their little kids, and people were busy scribbling away, which I found out afterwards where they were writing their notes to loved ones and their wills and all kinds of things like that. It was pretty nerve-wracking. One for a three, a question if you have the time. Okay, go ahead. Total number of persons on board, please. The actual number of people on board is 69, but Quintel is overtaxed. He gives a lower number in error. I have 33 people on board, including the crew. Okay. I have to ask if Sol's on board. Um, uh, I, I know he's busy. I don't want to ask him questions, uh, but I have to. This thing can go down in the lake or the field. Um, and I remember thinking, great. I know this airplane carries about 300 people. At least it's not 300. It was about regrets. It was about things I hadn't done in my life. It was about ways I've treated the odd person here or there that I wish I'd treated more gently. It was about um, how stupid I was of some of the things I used to make big issues out of that are so insignificant when it really comes down to what real reality is about. It was pretty devastating. And I remember telling uh, a mother with a baby, and I had... <laughs> my daughter, Victoria, and telling this woman that it was going to be okay. And I did it. I, did. I was so proud of myself that I could be so straight with her and tell her that it was going to be all right and really look at her in the eyes. Okay, and how far from the field are we now? You're 35, uh, correction, make that 39 miles from Winnipeg. Roger. Now that controllers can see Flight 143 on radar, they can provide Quintel with the information he needs to figure out if he can glide as far as Winnipeg. Roger, what is your altitude now? 8.5. 8.5. About 8,500 feet above the ground, Captain Pearson can see his destination. Winnipeg's airport is less than 35 miles away. We're visual. But the news from Quintel is not good. Bob. Morris was calmly keeping track of our distance. 
by input from Winnipeg Air Traffic Control and our altitude. And they calculated our profile and came to the conclusion that we might not make the runway in Winnipeg. We can last maybe another 20 miles. We're, we're not going to make Winnipeg. Quintel has calculated that at the rate they're falling, they would hit the ground a full 15 miles short of the runway. Uh, how far are we from Gimli? You're approximately 12 miles from Gimli right now. Uh, where is it? Which way is he moving? On your right. Turn right to a heading of uh, three, four, five. I would say you have 10 miles to fly. OK, fine. We're going to go there. I'm going to go check on my family. You guys don't need me up here right now, huh? No, no, we're OK. When I went to finally to sit down in my seat, this is where I thought, wow, you know, um, this is it. Landing gear down. Roger. First officer Quintel lowers the landing gear. Because there's no hydraulic power, Quintel does what's known as a gravity drop letting the gear's own weight drop and lock it into place. The two main gear are heavy. They fall immediately, and two green lights confirm they've locked. But the nose gear is lighter. It doesn't lock. We could hear the main gear clearly uh, falling and locking. I was not aware that the nose gear was, was not down and locked. It was sort of a last minute, and uh, if it's something that you cannot control, you don't talk about it, you don't mention it, you know. The main thing was bring the aircraft on the runway. Five miles to touchdown. Roger. We have the field in sight. Five miles from Gimli, Pearson and Kintel finally see a runway they can land on. But there's a problem. We're too close, huh? It's going to be too steep, too fast. Yeah, I know. Pearson is almost at the runway, but he's much too high above it. If he comes down at a normal descent rate, he'll miss the landing strip. But if he comes down steeply, his plane will gather a dangerous amount of speed. He won't be able to stop before the end of the runway. The normal approach, we have uh, leading edge and trailing edge flaps, which allow us to slow the airplane down and fly at a slower speed safely. We did not have those flaps as they run off the main hydraulic system. So uh, what are we going to do? So we discuss, we have two possibilities. One of them was to do a 360 degree turn and lose the, um, the excess of altitude. Uh, on the other hand, I thought it would take about three minutes. And uh, we were already uh, descending at the rate of 2,500 feet a minute. Only about 3,000 feet above the ground, the plane doesn't have enough altitude to make a full circle. It would hit the ground before making it back to the landing strip. Pearson chooses a second option. Well, I guess I'll just slip it. Pearson decides to try a maneuver called a side slip, practically unheard of on commercial airliners, but sometimes used by glider pilots. And Bob Pearson has a lot of experience flying gliders. I'm just going to slip it down till we're almost down at the runway, and I'll straighten it out. OK. Side slipping involves what's known as crossing the controls. Here we go. Pearson plans to force the aircraft into a sideways freefall, allowing it to drop quickly without increasing its forward airspeed. Pearson has never actually performed a side slip in a glider, but he's attempting one now in a Boeing 767. The only way that I could control our speed and our descent profile with the runway was to induce drag in the fuselage by cross-controlling the rudder and the elevators on the tail and the ailerons on the wingtips and cause the aircraft into a crab configuration. Then I could vary that to increase or decrease our speed or increase or decrease our descent rate. 
Pearson controls the plane's descent by using his rudders and ailerons to change the angle of the plane. Crossing the controls involves tipping the wings in one direction, but turning the aircraft in the opposite direction, pushing it sideways into the oncoming air. As Flight 143 begins to drop towards the Earth, Quintel is about to discover something he did not expect. The runway he trained at 15 years ago. no longer a runway. Captain Bob Pearson is out of fuel, out of engines, out of options. If he can't line up with the runway at Gimli, he doesn't get a second chance. Pearson turns the yoke left and pushes the rudders to the right. The plane slips to its left. We're sitting in the center, which is the heart of the airplane, where it starts, so it's pretty solid there. I thought there's a real good chance here that we'll be all right. However, when uh, he put the airplane into a side slip, uh, all that went out the window, because I figured, oh, if he hits a wing or something, it starts to catapult and roll, that's not going to work anymore. The 767 loses altitude quickly, plowing sideways through the air. When I looked to the left of the aircraft, I was looking directly at the ground because the airplane is, is angled quite, well, about maybe 60 degrees of banks. The bank angle was quite high, and the nose of the aircraft was quite high. And it was an awkward uh, moment, and uh, if it was awkward for me, I can imagine for the passengers, it must really have uh, felt odd. I saw a sand trap from this golf course, and I thought, we're going to crash. Pearson must maintain a crucial balance. He's got to slow the plane enough to be able to land safely. But if he slows down too much, the airliner could lose its lift and plummet to the ground. When a pilot is normally landing an airplane, he's maneuvering the flight controls and operating the thrust levers pretty continuously on most landings. And uh, so I was doing the same thing without the thrust levers. This is where I thought of my daughter, Victoria, being alone with my husband and um, and how he was going to cope with with uh, with our daughter and how she was going to cope without having a mom. As they approach, Pearson focuses on his target, the threshold of the runway. I got tunnel vision uh, like I've never had it before. It was just our speed and our relationship with the threshold of the runway. But now, only hundreds of feet from the ground. Kintel sees that their troubles are far from over. The Gimli landing strip has been converted into a drag racing strip. Today is Saturday, and it's not just a race day. It's a family day on the Gimli strip. Racing is done for the day. But the airfield is filled with members of the local sports car club, camping out with their families for the weekend. Two children have decided to pedal the length of the runway. They don't hear the plane coming for them. Without engines, it's silent. And one thing the 767 doesn't have is a horn. Brace. Brace for landing. The nose hit with quite a bang on the runway. Sounded like a shotgun going off at our feet. The front landing gear gives out immediately. Pearson brakes hard. Two tires blow out. The bottom of the right engine scrapes the runway. I was a robot. There was just no emotion at all. Finally, Pearson sees what's in their path. And I looked up and I could see two boys on bicycles. They must have been 
probably about a thousand feet down the runway from our position when I saw them. And then at one point, I can see he raised his head and he's surprised. Here's this big aircraft. Uh, I can still remember the look of terror on their faces. So they were close enough for me to see that. With no nose gear to steer with, Pearson's only hope of driving the plane left or right is by varying the brake pressure on the two main landing gear. That's when my heart started to pitter-patter a little bit. The kids panic and try to outrun a plane that's traveling about 200 miles an hour. I knew I couldn't take the airplane into these boys and I was going to take it off into the grass on the right side. There were campers along the, the uh, west side of the runway uh, that I didn't notice until after we'd touched down. And the nose was on the ground and uh, I can still remember out the left side, people standing by their barbecues. Dino Calvert is at the track with his friends for a weekend of racing. One of the gentlemen in the pits suddenly jumped in his car and he took off and I thought, well, you don't drive like that in the pits usually. And I looked up and all I could see was smoke rising. Pearson does all he can to stop the plane in time. Holy crow! The plane plows into a guardrail installed down the middle of the runway. Smoke, Bob. Seventeen minutes after running out of fuel, Air Canada Flight 143 comes to a final stop on the ground. <laughs> yeah? You okay? <laughs> Somebody yelled, Yahoo, or something, and then people started applauding. And we were so grateful. We made it. When you believe that you're going to crash, you do believe that the airplane is going to break apart, you're going to have um, fire. Evacuate! 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 All right, let's go. we got to get off. Thick smoke is quickly filling the cabin. The crew doesn't take any chances. They want everyone off the plane as quickly as possible. There was a sense of joy, and then, then a panic, kind of. It seemed to go in waves, and then a panic saying, we got to get out of here, we got to get out of here. Less than two months earlier, an Air Canada DC-9 made a successful emergency landing in Cincinnati, only to burst into flames on the tarmac before all the passengers could get off. 23 people died. The crew and passengers of this flight want to avoid a similar fate. It took maybe uh, just a few seconds to, to come up to a full halt on the runway, but uh, the cockpit was full of smoke. Passenger evacuation checklist. Passenger checklist. <sighs> Fuel shut off. Off. Cabin depressurized. Electrics off. Electrics off. Checklist complete. Time to get out of here. Come on, guys, get some fire extinguishers. We grabbed the fire extinguishers on our way, and you never go to a fire at a racetrack without having a fire extinguisher with you. And uh, we ran up towards it. The doors open up, and you see the, the chutes come out, and sort of like a spider growing legs. The um, plane ended up eventually standing almost what, what appeared to me to be almost on its nose. When I opened my door and I saw that the chute was so steep, I thought, oh my goodness, how do I get these passengers to go down? Due to the nose down angle of the plane, the two rear slides don't reach the ground. 10 people are slightly injured during the evacuation, most of them coming down the steep rear slides. I heard on the west radar frequency, he said, uh, one of the 767 says, uh, he's down okay, he's in one piece, and that's when our cheer went up. <laughs> I said, okay, <laughs> because all of these people were gonna sleep in their own bed that night. <laughs> There's still a lot of smoke coming from the plane's nose. Turned out it was about six inches of insulation between the inner and outer skins. From friction, that was starting to burn. 
The flight attendants have good news. All 61 passengers have made it off the plane. There's not so much as a single serious injury. We'll give you a hand. Yeah, extinguisher. Bob Pearson has done what no one has done before. He's safely landed a 767 with no engines, gliding to safety for more than 26,000 feet. Air Canada Flight 143 glided... Through. The event makes international headlines immediately. People are already asking how one of the most sophisticated passenger planes in the world could have run out of fuel. Sliding down emergency chutes. By the next day, the investigation has already begun. Bill Taylor and Diane Rochelot of Canada's Aviation Safety Bureau are among the first investigators at the scene. I was a junior mechanical engineering at the time. I had been working for Transport Canada for a year. Going to the field for the first time was uh, very exciting. It was, uh, it was new. It was a major aircraft. Once we got into the uh, fuel quantity indicating system, I actually left uh, Diane to um, deal with the specifics of the computer system. First, Bill Taylor needs to confirm what everyone has been telling him, that the plane is out of fuel. Investigators drain the tanks, collecting less than 17 gallons of fuel. The 767 can hold almost 24,000 gallons. It's like having five tablespoons of fuel in a mid-sized car. Taylor next needs to examine the possibility that the fuel leaked out during the flight. The other checks involve looking for any evidence of fuel having been lost. I even went so far as to go into what they call the dry bay of the, uh, of the aircraft. I'm a bit claustrophobic, so I, I really wasn't uh, too enthused about going up in there, but uh, I crawled up and uh, had a look around with the flashlight and confirmed that there was no evidence of fuel having been lost in there. That leaves Taylor with only one conclusion. Flight 143 took off without enough fuel. Now investigators need to find out why. In one piece. Diane Rochelot begins looking for the answer to that question in the plane's sophisticated electronics bay, located beneath the cabin. The 767 was a, a newer type aircraft, and uh, it did have a lot of computerized system. And I guess back in 1982, these were coming onto the market at a fast rate, and they were newer types of uh, electronic system. Rochelot confirms that a computerized unit, the digital fuel gauge processor, had been malfunctioning on this plane. There was no spare in Montreal, so it couldn't be replaced. Rochelot takes the component for testing. It was decided early on that the unit, the fuel processing unit, would be taken to the manufacturer Honeywell in Indianapolis for testing. And uh, I was tasked with uh, taking the unit. So we went through all the testing procedure. And then at one point, we did discover that there was a malfunction with the unit. During the testing, we went more and more in depth. And we found out that uh, one of the circuit, it's called an inductor coil. It was a very, very small part, and it was encapsulated at manufacturer, and encapsulated means it's covered with plastic. You cannot visually see it because it's now covered with plastic, and you can't see the, the inductor coil itself. Uh, but once we took over the, the plastic case, we could see that the solder joint had not been made properly, which caused a malfunction in the uh, system. The faulty processor explains why Pearson didn't have fuel gauges for the flight but doesn't explain why he didn't have enough fuel. The inoperative gauges were clearly flagged. Ground crews wouldn't have relied on them when they were fueling the plane. Investigators confirmed that the ground crew did perform a manual check of the fuel before takeoff. We just need to know what you did next. Yeah, we did a manual check of both tanks, and then we pump enough fuel for the trip to Edmund. Flight 143 should have taken off with enough fuel for the trip. OK, thanks. That helps.
Investigators now have to figure out how one of the world's most advanced jetliners took off with half the fuel necessary for its flight. The investigators know that with its fuel gauges out of service, Flight 143's fuel tanks were checked manually. Then the fuel for the trip to Edmonton was added to the tanks. But before the plane could be given more fuel, a crucial calculation had to be carried out. Pilots need to know the weight of the fuel on their plane. But fuel trucks pump jet fuel by volume. In order for pilots and fuelers to communicate, a simple routine translation between volume and weight has to be made. Thank you. Investigators check and double check that math. <sighs> the fueling records from the day of the accident provide the answers they've been looking for. This is a typical fueling record. But when investigators examine the calculations for flight 143, and this is from flight 143. They look anything but straightforward. The document clearly shows the amount of fuel in the right and left tanks, but investigators are troubled by two particular numbers. One converts volume to kilograms, the other converts it to pounds. He shouldn't have been using both. So did you convert to pounds or to kilograms? To pound? Oh, take to, to kilo. Excuse me, can I see that again? Further interviews with the technicians and crew reveal that the events on Flight 143... And now I don't know what I did. ...were caused by human error involving poor calculations and ultimately inadequate training. Okay, fellas, we've finished with the fuel. The technicians refueling Flight 143 got muddled in their calculations while converting the volume coming out of the fuel truck to the weight of the fuel in the plane's tanks. No one who saw the calculations that day noticed the basic error. In 1983, Canadian ground crews were used to converting the amount of fuel leaving their trucks into pounds. The 767 was the first plane in Air Canada's fleet to have metric fuel gauges. Its fuel should have been measured not in pounds, but in kilograms, which requires a different calculation. Flight 143 needed 22,300 kilograms of fuel for the trip. But pilots and technicians let it leave with 22,300 pounds instead. Because a pound is about half a kilogram, the plane only got half the fuel it required, which explains why Pearson's flight computer told him he had plenty of fuel. He entered the wrong amount of fuel to start with. In the past, the flight engineer calculated the fuel loads. This accident raised an important question. Whose job was it with the two-man crew? Better training is definitely an issue in an incident such as that. If everyone is, is trained and the uh, lines are drawn as to who's responsible for what, uh, then there's no uh, ambiguity on it. The people know what they're responsible for. In this case, it was sort of uh, open-ended. They really, we weren't aware who was responsible for the, the final say on this field stuff. A subsequent inquiry found that none of those involved that day was trained in metric calculations. Not the ground technicians, not the pilots. I had not received any, uh, neither of us had received any uh, training at all. 
on, on doing these calculations. The computer that had replaced the 767's flight engineer was broken, and no one knew who should be doing its job. Air Canada 143 was essentially down a man. And the goal is to prevent a recurrence of this particular event. And also, we also find out um, other systems that might have been uh, either at fault or maybe they could cause a problem in, in the future. And you do try to prevent recurrence. All right. It took a string of mechanical and human failures for Flight 143 to run out of fuel. But another failure that day may have saved some lives. If the plane's nose gear had not collapsed, it would have taken Pearson much longer to stop. The plane could have slid into the people who were at the strip that day, which would have had catastrophic results. There could have been more injuries or even loss of life. Pearson and Quintel were partly blamed for their roles in the incident. A government inquiry recommended that Air Canada re-evaluate the training of flight crews and ground technicians in metric fuel conversions. It also recommended that the airline keep more spare parts, such as fuel gauge processors. Rick Dion retired in 2003 after a long career as Air Canada's coordinator of maintenance control. First Officer Maurice Quintel was promoted to captain in 1989. Captain Bob Pearson went on to fly 10 more years for Air Canada, his experience at Gimli shaping the rest of his career as a commercial pilot. This experience affected me uh, mostly by giving me, making me more relaxed as a pilot, giving me the feeling that as much as I've trained for all those years, that there's always that question about how you're going to perform when the, when the chips are down, and I now have the feeling that no matter what, as long as an aircraft stay together, I would get it safely back on the ground. And so it's been a relaxing experience. It's the knowledge that you know under stress you can perform. Before that, you don't know. You just hope you will, and you train, you train for it, but you never know. With the things that they had to deal with was magnificent. I think they got proven in the simulator in Vancouver they tried out this um, same circumstances with several crews, and they all crashed. Probably the most important thing that came out of it was the realization that uh, when something new is, is introduced, uh, special attention and training needs to be uh, accomplished for people to be aware what they're dealing with. When we had landed and, and the airplane was all in one piece, I thought, wow, I got another chance. Had to fly again. Because of a tragedy like that, once you take your deck of cards and fire it in the air, you're truly free. And I guess from that point of view, Gimli could, uh, one, I could, I find it very difficult to say, but Gimli was maybe almost the best thing that ever happened to me, next to meeting my wonderful wife and marrying her. Two days after the landing at Gimli, Air Canada's 767 was back in the air on its way to Winnipeg for repairs. A quarter century later, that same plane is still in service, and it still carries the nickname that Bob Pearson earned it, the Gimli Glider. Early morning, June the 23rd, 1985. A 747 flies across the Atlantic Ocean nine and a half kilometers above the water. The jumbo jet is nicknamed Kanishka, after an Indian emperor. And Air India promises passengers it will be a palace in the sky. Indian hospitality is, is something that the culture prides itself on. And you do experience that when you fly Air India. The colors are rich and warm inside. It's your gateway to India. On its way from Canada, the plane is heading to London, England before continuing on to New Delhi. It's been in the air for four and a half hours. Captain Hanse Narendra is a veteran Air India pilot. 
Satwinder Binder is a captain too, who's serving as first officer on the flight. As the plane nears land, Binder talks with the flight's purser. Yes, sir? In charge. Do me a small favor. At the back of the plane, seat 54, a boy is sitting there. He just wanted to have a look in the cockpit. Can I tell him now? After about 15 to 20 minutes. There are 329 people on board, including passengers and crew. Many of them are flying to India to visit family or friends. Vishnu Pada is traveling to India with his two daughters. Their mother, Lata, is already waiting for them there. We had decided that it would be the ideal year to take an extended vacation in India as a family. Six minutes after eight in the morning, co-pilot Binder makes radio contact with air traffic control in Ireland. Shanrik, Air India 182, good morning. Station Colin Shannon, go ahead again, please. Thomas Lane and Michael Quinn are working at the Shannon Control Center. Air India 182 is 51 North, 15 West at level 310. Estimate FIR at 0735. Air India 182, Shannon Roger. Cleared for London, flight level 310. Air India 182 is cleared to London, maintain 310. You want to come up front now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's a light morning at Shannon Control. They're dealing with just three planes. But something peculiar has happened. The signals are all jumbled up. The signals on radar merged so that it was totally impossible to read the call signs and flight levels of any of the three aircraft. The Air India 747 is flying at 31,000 feet. A TWA jet is several thousand feet above it. And a CP flight is 2,000 feet higher. All are traveling east. Because the planes are stacked on top of each other, the signals have merged on the controller's two-dimensional screen. Tom moved the tracker ball on radar and separated the signals. Two of the planes reappear on the radar, but the Air India flight has vanished. Air India is not showing up. Hold on a minute. Air India 182, do you read? Air India 182, this is Shannon, do you read? Over. It's 8.14 in the morning. I had a gut feeling. To this day, I don't know why I picked up the phone. Yes, it's Michael Quinn at Shannon. We have a plane off radar. Normally, a distress call to search and rescue isn't made until a plane has been out of contact for more than 20 minutes. The Air India flight has been missing less than 60 seconds. Several ships in the area begin searching for signs of the plane. Its last known position is some 290 kilometers southwest of Cork. Just two hours after the plane disappears, a Canadian-owned cargo ship in the area confirms the worst. The first pieces of wreckage are discovered. Uninflated life rafts are spotted bobbing in the cold Atlantic. Then bodies are seen. 
it's quickly clear that no one has survived. In India, Lata Pada is waiting for her husband and two children to arrive when she hears the news from her brother. He sat me down and told me that, uh, you know, something terrible had happened. I was just uh, in total shock and, uh, you know, uh, part of me was trying to digest the information and part of me was trying to imagine if indeed the worst had happened, how I was going to continue my life without them. Dozens of bodies arrive in Cork. Many more will follow. Now investigators are faced with the enormous task of finding out how they died and what had caused the crash of Air India Flight 182. One hundred and thirty thousand people live in the city of Cork. Tucked into the southern coast of Ireland, it's long been a vital seaport. On June the 23rd, 1985, a gruesome cargo begins arriving at the city's docks. Just hours after Air India Flight 182 crashes into the sea, Bodies and wreckage are brought in by boat. Dr. Cumin Doyle is a pathologist at the Cork Regional Hospital. The first bodies arrived at 4.45 p.m. on that Sunday afternoon. And at 12 midnight, we had 130 bodies. Doyle and his team will examine the bodies to see if they can find any signs of what caused the crash. It's an enormous undertaking for everybody involved, the hospital personnel, the, the uh, police, the Navy, the Army, and pathologists like ourselves. But we just had to get on and do the job. There are so many autopsies to perform that Doyle moves the work into the building's gym. We had three police people working on each body, photographer, a ballistics expert, and a forensic odontologist. That is a person who examines the teeth, the face, for identification purposes. In just four days, autopsies are performed on 132 victims. All parts of the body were examined externally in detail and every, every detail was noted down. We were looking, of course, for the causes of the fatalities. Doyle makes a telling discovery. Almost all the victims died in the air. Only two of the bodies showed signs of drowning, which indicated that the others were were not breathing when they hit the water. There's something else that's common to many of the victims. A large number have had their clothes torn off. Now, that was important, because if they had no clothes or little clothes, it indicated that they had fallen from 31,000 feet or so where this accident occurred. Some of the bodies also have signs of so-called flail injuries. These are breaks specific to bones in the hips, shoulders, and other joints. H.S. Kohler is the lead investigator into the Air India disaster. The flail injuries tell him the passengers weren't in the plane when it hit the ocean. They are caused by tumbling, violent motion of the body in air. And that is the pattern of the injuries when a passenger is thrown out of the aircraft at a high altitude. The autopsies show that somehow the plane had been ripped apart high above the water. Passengers were thrown into the sky long before the plane crashed. Based on the injuries, 
we could only say that the plane had broken up at 31,000 feet. We couldn't say what the cause of the breakup was. The biggest challenge in this accident was that we had no physical evidence available to us in this accident in terms of wreckage, in terms of passengers, crew, or in terms of eyewitnesses. In this accident, we had nothing. The most important job of the investigators is to try to find the plane's black boxes. The two devices record cockpit conversation and other technical information about the flight of the plane. The recorders have radio beacons which send out a signal at a designated frequency. But it's still a huge task. The boxes are more than 6,500 feet below the surface. And the radio signals last just 30 days. Salim Jiwa is a journalist who has investigated the Air India disaster. The search for the black boxes was urgent, and, and uh, three countries participated in it, England, Ireland, and, and India. But even with such a massive response, early efforts are frustrated. 42 kilohertz. It's too high. It can't be there. Investigators are picking up radio signals, but they're at the wrong frequency. As the search continues, H.S. Kohler and his team study the maintenance history of the plane. They want to know if an undetected flaw had caused the jet to come apart in flight. they uncover a potentially important piece of information. The Air India jet was flying with five engines. A 747 normally has four engines, but it can carry more. The plane was designed so that it could transport a malfunctioning engine beneath its wings. Ground crews can mount the engine to a bracket on the plane, it's exactly what happened to the Air India jet. There was an extra engine that a previous flight had left behind that was mounted uh, on, on the wing of the aircraft. The extra engine creates substantial drag on the left side of the plane. If the pilots don't properly compensate, the plane will start turning in that direction. And this hypothesis continued that there is possibility that this fifth engine might have caused the breakup of the wing. In fact, investigators discover that before the plane took off for London, the flight engineer noticed problems with the way the engine was attached. There's a small problem in the fifth engine. I've asked them to fix it up. All right. Investigators also learned that some internal parts of the extra engine were taken out and stored in Flight 182's cargo bay. They are so enormous that pieces of the cargo door were removed to make the job easier. Some of the other parts of the engine went into um, the rear of the aircraft. Aircraft uh, such as the 747 can handle this quite easily, it's routinely done. But if the cargo door wasn't reassembled properly, it could have led to an explosive decompression. In 1974, a cargo door blew off a Turkish Airlines flight shortly after it took off from Paris. The sudden decompression crippled the plane. It crashed moments later, killing everyone on board. Kohler must consider two theories. Either problems with the door or with the extra engine itself brought down the plane. If either one had taken place, there should be evidence on the plane's black boxes. Finding the recorders has become increasingly important. Almost two weeks after the search begins, investigators get news that helps them pinpoint the location of the black boxes. The signal will be higher. 
So this 42 kilohertz could be it. Tell the boats to look again. The piece of the black box which broadcasts the locator signal is made of ceramic. If it's damaged, the frequency of the signal can change. It means the strange frequency ships detected earlier could be the right one. Both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder are finally located. But they're so deep, it's difficult to bring them up. The aircraft was uh, at 6,000 feet below the sea, um, and it was the depth that was sort of defeating. A deep sea submersible is brought in. But even with this specialized vehicle and with the location of the black boxes known, it takes four attempts to bring the recorders to the surface. Estimate FIR at 0735. Air India 182, Shannon Roger. Lead investigator Kohler now has what he hopes are two vital pieces of the puzzle. If there's any problem in the aircraft, the crew will be talking about the problem. They will not be silent about the problem. But when he listens to the cockpit voice recorder, Kohler hears nothing unusual. After the last contact with air traffic control in Shannon, the voice recorder picks up the crew talking about customs seals. It's paperwork that has to be completed before landing. They want about 30 custom seals. Custom? Yeah, custom seals to seal the bar before its arrival. Bar I... The conversation ends in mid-sentence. That was it. And then everything was, of course, uh, silent. The cockpit voice recorder indicated that there was no abnormality in the cockpit, no, ab no emergency. Every conversation was normal. The plane's flight data recorder tells a similar story. Kohler pours through details about Air India's speed, altitude, and dozens of other pieces of information. The extra engine did cause the plane to bang slightly, and the jet's rudder was turned 11 degrees to the right. But this was exactly what the crew needed to do to offset the drag created by the fifth engine. We found that all parameters of the aircraft, aircraft altitude, aircraft heading, aircraft bank attitude, roll attitude, autopilot engage, everything was working normally till the last point. After analyzing both black boxes, Kohler can't find any evidence that the plane was in trouble before it suddenly disappeared from radar. But the very lack of evidence does suggest something. Both recorders get their power from the plane's engines. Both stopped at exactly 14 minutes and one second after eight in the morning. Since the recorders stopped working at the same time, the problem on the plane had to be catastrophic enough to sever the jet's electronic system before the crew could react. Yeah, custom seals to seal the bar before its arrival. Bar Investigators are becoming convinced that there are only two possible explanations for the crash. A devastating decompression or a bomb. They study the wreckage that's been found floating on the surface of the ocean, but it's just a small percentage of the entire plane. And none of it is helpful to investigators. It offers no clues to explain why the plane crashed. We knew there was no fire. We knew the aircraft was performing well. Everything was normal. There was no cockpit emergency, no warning. We got elimination of all the things, but we did not got the answer is what happened. We, we, to go to the cause of the accident, we had to go to the wreckage which was lying at the bottom of the sea. But what parts of the plane should investigators focus on? The black boxes were equipped with radio transmitters which made them easier to find. But the debris field is deep underwater and enormous, some 16 kilometers long and six kilometers across. How do investigators identify the one clue that will help them unlock the mystery? Roy Truman is an underwater salvage expert. 
He's brought in to do something that's never been done before. Retrieve the ruined pieces of a jumbo jet from the bottom of the ocean. In hundreds of thousands of pieces, he needs to find the ones that will explain why the plane crashed. Up until that time, we had only been used with recovering small aircraft. Uh, here, we're talking about a 747, which was huge, and we had no idea of the size of the pieces and what we were gonna find. Investigators know they can't bring the entire wreck to the surface. It's so deep, it takes hours to recover a single piece. The submersible takes underwater video and still photos. Investigators use those to decide which pieces to bring to the surface. It was a narrow corridor, and at each end of the corridor, it was very light wreckage. Uh, all of the heavy stuff, engines, main aircraft structure was, was in the middle of the wreckage field. Like searching for a needle in an underwater haystack, investigators hope to discover the cause of the crash in a tangle of ruined metal. But autumn is coming. Soon the weather will turn bad and they'll have to abandon their search. The key to unlocking the disaster still lies somewhere at the bottom of the ocean. Investigators from India are scouring the ocean floor, trying to find out why Air India Flight 182 fell from the sky. As the work continues in Ireland, there's growing suspicion in Canada that the Air India crash was no accident. As police and investigators sift through the list of passengers on the plane, they find something peculiar. Many of the passengers who were on Air India Flight 182 began their day in Vancouver. They were using another plane to connect to Flight 182. One of the passengers who bought a ticket for that plane never got on. Well, the passenger, um, we have never identified him per se, but the ticket uh, identified him as M. Singh. Uh, it simply had an initial, but no full name. Uh, we believe that name to be, uh, was fictitious and that the person never intended to travel. While he never boarded the plane, M. Singh did check in. Next, please. Anyway, to Toronto? And I want my bag checked through to Delhi. Sir, I can't do that. Your reservation is only confirmed to Toronto. Oh, I am confirmed. This is my ticket. Jeannie Adams is a ticket agent working for Canadian Pacific. Mr. Singh, you are on standby to Delhi, I can't. But then I have to pick up my bag. I can't check your bags through to India if you are not confirmed. But I am indeed confirmed. Wait, I'll get my brother, he'll tell you. There are as many as 30 people waiting to check in. Adams doesn't have time to wait for the man's brother. Oh, uh, okay, okay, I, I'll check it through. But you have to check with Air India when you get to Toronto. Proceed is 10B. Even though Singh doesn't have a ticket taking him to India, his bag is checked straight through. His luggage is loaded, but no one notices that Singh never boards the plane that leaves Vancouver. She broke the rules as they were. She should not have allowed that to go through for New Delhi interline. But she was so bullied and so browbeaten by Mr. Singh in front of everybody else that I think to her eternal sadness and, and, and heartbreak, um, she gave in. Singh's maroon bag didn't raise any concerns when it was loaded in Vancouver. Since the Air India flight was international, when the bag arrived in Toronto, it faced a more strict series of inspections. This is what it will sound like. John D'Souza is a security officer for Air India. 
the day of the flight, he demonstrated a portable explosives detector for baggage handlers in Toronto. Chemicals in a match triggered the device, as would chemicals used in some explosives. Okay. The portable device was put to use because the X-ray machine, which normally scans every piece of luggage, had broken down. The technology, especially the X-ray technology, were very, uh, very weak, very in their infancy at that time, and they, it didn't work reliably. And in, in the case of the Air India episode, the technology went quite badly wrong, which was one of the tragedies of this situation. As security workers used the portable explosives wand on the bags, everything seemed normal until they got to the maroon bag. The bag did trigger the device, but the sound it made was very different from the one workers heard during the demonstration. The bag was passed and allowed on board the plane, eventually flying towards England. As Air India Flight 182 flies over the Atlantic Ocean, carrying M. Singh's bag, an explosion rips through Tokyo's Narita Airport. Two baggage handlers are killed, four people are injured. A bomb has been hidden inside another piece of luggage that came from Vancouver. Luggage that was bound for another Air India jet. And it was headed for uh, the cargo hold when it exploded uh, on the ground, once it was put on the bag, was probably just thumped a little bit, and uh, it exploded as the two Japanese baggage handlers were putting it on a conveyor belt. Just as on flight 182, one of the bags being moved in Tokyo was checked in by a passenger who never boarded the flight. There was no uh, X-ray machines uh, in use at Vancouver Airport. There was nothing to stop that bag from flying to, to Tokyo. There's a disturbing connection between the Tokyo bombing and the Air India flight. The tickets for the men who checked both bags were bought on the same day by the same customer. The single crash of Air India Flight 182 has suddenly become part of a much larger story. With the apparent connection between the two incidents, investigators in Ireland are extremely interested in what police find in Tokyo. Soon after the bombing, forensic experts descend on Japan's Narita airport. There are traces of evidence everywhere. The Narita bombing uh, uh, was, was within a confined space. So unlike the Air India Flight 182 situation where we had debris scattered over nine miles of under the ocean and pretty hard to retrieve. We had, uh, the, in a sense, the good fortune of, uh, of uh, a contained area where an explosive device went off. Pieces of metal and circuit boards are embedded in the walls. Explosive residue clings to parts of the container that housed the bomb. Amazingly, Japanese forensic experts were able to pick out tiny parts and fragments. And all the analysis finally led Japanese police to identify the vehicle that was used to carry the bomb. Experts even find serial numbers on pieces of the wreckage. Clues that show the bomb was hidden inside a specific stereo tuner made by Sanyo. All 2,000 tuners that were ever made were shipped to a warehouse near Vancouver, British Columbia. From there, they were sent to stores across the region. One of those tuners carried the bomb that exploded at Narita. Police have a difficult task trying to trace the sale of 2,000 tuners. They could have been sold to anyone. Most of the stores that had received the tuner had been sold out for years. 
But police get a break when they ask about the tuna at a store in Duncan, a tiny town on Vancouver Island. The last unit had been sold just a few weeks ago. They were able to figure out who bought the, the stereo tuna which contained the bomb. Police obtained the same sort of tuna that was used to house the bomb on Air India. They conduct tests to see how big the bomb would have to be to create the sort of damage that was found in Tokyo. There was a, a progressive experimentation using, using dynamite to find out the, the extent of uh, damage uh, particular strands of dynamite would, would cause. They match the size of the tuna fragments made after each explosion with the fragments that were found at Narita. They discover that just a few sticks of dynamite were likely used in the Tokyo bomb. But could just four sticks of dynamite really bring down a jet? Once they discover just how powerful the Narita bomb was, police place it into a fully loaded luggage container. The devastation is enormous. Any decompression caused by uh, an event, uh, or an explosive device in the luggage hole, uh, would be sufficient to cause uh, catastrophic results for that aircraft. You don't need much. Uh, four sticks of dynamite can do the job. The cramped quarters of a cargo hold amplify the power of a bomb. Tests conducted at Penn State University show that the shock waves created from a bomb blast don't travel in just one direction, but reverberate inside a luggage container building on each other, vastly increasing the initial force of the explosion. If a bomb had indeed exploded in the cargo hold of Air India, it would have caused enormous amounts of destruction. It's the sort of damage that should have left its mark on the remains of Flight 182. Investigators have a growing suspicion that this plane was brought down by a bomb but they still have no proof. So the investigators were not only looking for uh, uh, something that was broken that might have caused the failure, but they were looking for signs of what caused the explosion, such as uh, burning or uh, solvent uh, stains or possibly shrapnel in seats. It meant a lot a scrutiny of every piece of wreckage. We kept on analyzing each photograph. Is it giving any indication of an explosion? Is it giving any impact damage? Knowing his time is running out, Kohler selects a few key pieces of the plane to bring to the surface. Bad weather forces him to leave the rest behind. Kohler hopes the bits he does have can prove there was a bomb on board. Each piece that's brought up is carefully mapped to its original position on the jet. One of the most promising sections brought up from the bottom is the floor of the front cargo bay. When we recovered that item, we found that it had holes which are of a very special nature. Penetration from inside to outside at a very high speed. Curling of the edges of that one. And that was indicative of that perhaps this is the place where the explosion had occurred. As many as 20 holes are found. In each, the metal is bent outward, like the petals of a flower. These are classic signs of something being blown out from the cargo bay. On the side wall of the cargo bay, investigators find more clues. Additional holes are discovered, like the ones on the floor. These also appear to have been blown out from the cargo hold. A closer study of the ceiling of the cargo bay also indicates that the ribs connecting it to the fuselage were broken by being forced up. Investigators are convinced 
that the wreckage shows that a bomb had exploded in the forward cargo hold. If the bomb had gone off in the front of the plane, it would explain why the flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder cut off so quickly. Like other 747s, the electronics bay on the Air India flight is located below the cockpit. Many of the important electrical systems on the plane run through here. The forward luggage compartment is right beside it. And so when the bomb went off, the explosion would have taken out the computers completely, and there would have been absolutely dead silence, and that's precisely what happened. Investigators are convinced that Air India Flight 182 has been destroyed by a bomb. This was no accident. The crash of the passenger jet was a crime. Nobody, nobody uh, thought that such an evil plot of blowing two aircraft simultaneously would occur from Vancouver. Exhaustive detective work creates a clear picture of what likely happened on board the Air India jet. In Toronto, M. Singh's bag is taken off the Vancouver flight and moved onto the Air India jet. It's put into a luggage container that's eventually placed at the front of the jet, right behind the plane's electronics bay. As the plane sailed over the Atlantic Ocean, the crew had no warning that a bomb was ticking down to disaster. They want about 30 custom seals. Customs? Yeah, custom seals to seal the bar before its arrival. Bar when the force of the blast hit the floor of the jet, it pushed it violently upwards. The thin fuselage would have been blown apart. The air pressure inside the plane would have rushed out, tearing passengers from the cabin and fatally crippling the jet. The debris scattered over nine miles is an indication of how, how rapidly and how, uh, how, how fearsome this, this whole decompression was. But in this instance, the aircraft completely didn't stand a chance of flight. There was no way of continuing flight in this case. As the jet fell towards the sea, the forces put on the fuselage tore it apart. It would have a tail torn off and the wings would start breaking. Uh, and there's no way of sustaining flight after that. Uh, it, it goes into gyrations. Um, once it goes into gyrations, there was m just massive structural failure. After months of painstaking work, investigators believe they have unraveled the cause of the Air India crash. They've proven a bomb brought the plane down. It's now up to police to find the bombers. But with so many deaths and so many more possible if the Narita bomb had exploded in midair, there's immediate interest in making passenger jets safer. This was one of the biggest disasters in the Indian aviation history. And it could have been avoided if the procedures were in place. As the hunt for the killers continues, extraordinary steps are taken to tighten security and to see if jets can be made to withstand the force of a bomb. It's May 1997. More than 10 years after a terrorist bomb destroyed Air India Flight 182. An out-of-service 747 is about to take part in a remarkable test. Two bombs are placed in the front cargo bay. Two more are put in the back. Well, the Burningthorpe test was actually intended to prove five years' worth of research, that we can protect an airplane using hardened luggage containers or hardened liners in the cargo hold. 
The plane is also pressurized to simulate the conditions a jet would encounter at cruising altitude. Pressurization is the key to that kind of experiment. Uh, the added energy that you have from the, the pressurization inside the airplane adds to the damage. Uh, you can think of it as a balloon. If you take a pin and you put it in a balloon that's uninflated, you get just a simple hole the size of the pin. However, if you blow that balloon up and you hit it with a pin, it pops catastrophically. When the bombs are detonated, the result is devastating. The force of the blast plus the pressure inside the jet just tore the plane apart. And that's the closest we can come to seeing what would have happened to a jet in flight. The destructive power of bombs on jets is well known. But what the tests at Bruntingthorpe showed was that relatively simple measures can substantially minimize the damage caused by an explosion. One of the bombs in the rear cargo hold was placed in a normal luggage container. But the bombs in the front cargo hold were different. One was placed in a specialized container strengthened with a material similar to that found in bulletproof vests. The other was put in a normal container, but placed beside walls that had been reinforced with a blast-absorbing liner. When the bombs explode, the front of the plane is virtually untouched. We had no breach of the airplane skin with the liner or with the hardened luggage containers. But towards the, the rear of the airplane or the tail, where we didn't have any of the hardened materials, it was a catastrophic failure for the airplane. The standard luggage container did nothing to minimize the blast. Both the protective lining in the front cargo bay and the hardened luggage container were able to absorb the force of the explosion. It's only speculation. Would steps like these have saved Air India? Very likely. Would they make uh, the industry safer today? Absolutely. Despite the dramatic results of the tests in Britain, hardened luggage containers are not used by world's airlines. While effective at stopping bombs, they're extremely expensive. The hardened containers are not in use now because it's just not economically feasible. The containers cost the tens of thousands of dollars uh, just to purchase, and they're very fragile. They're composite materials, so if you run into the side of a forklift, they're pretty much useless from that point forward. There have been significant improvements made to the way that passenger luggage is screened at most international airports. More sophisticated color X-ray systems using multiple scanning beams are now used. But I am indeed confirmed. Wait, I'll get my brother. He'll tell you. Oh, uh, OK, OK, I'll check it through. But you have to check with Air India when you get to Toronto. And there are stricter regulations about luggage getting sent forward on connecting flights. In the case of Air India, the most important thing of all was passenger baggage reconciliation. This is the key to detecting an explosive device or a terrorist. No plane leaves with baggage unattached to a specific passenger inside that plane. And, and that must be so. is 10B. I think one of the, the most difficult piece of news for the families to accept was the many ways in which this tragedy could have been prevented. I mean, it was absolutely unforgivable that a bag could be interlined to another destination without a passenger accompanying it. The quality of training that security guards at airports get also came under scrutiny during the years after the Air India crash. It's still an area of concern for some security experts. There's a real failure to train security personnel. And that failure is because you cannot pay rent a cop subsistent wages to look after the, your security when you get on board an aircraft. 
In the Air India case, police eventually trace the bombing to Sikh extremists living in Canada. They're fighting to have an independent Sikh homeland created in India. The man who confessed to assembling the bomb is sent to prison. The man suspected of masterminding the plot is killed several years later while under arrest in India. Both men had deep ties to Canada's West Coast Sikh community. It's a connection that still bothers Lata Pada. It was a deliberate act of terrorism and hurts even more that they were executed by Canadians on Canadian soil against Canadians. More than 20 years after the destruction of the Air India flight, the shock of the day is still fresh. And many questions remain unanswered. We still don't know who the two people were who checked in the bags. Apart from the basics of uh, who made the bomb, uh, we don't know much about who else assisted them. Uh, we don't know who picked up those tickets. There's a vow of silence that has hindered the investigation. This inquiry will be launched immediately. In 2006, the Canadian government launched an inquiry into the Air India bombing, another investigation of what happened and why. The shocking death of so many is a continuing source of anger and disbelief. No matter what the inquiry finds, the sobering facts are the same. 329 people killed in an instant. There are memorials now in Ireland and Canada, mourning the victims of the Air India crash, marking the day a terrorist bomb ripped through the lives of so many. It's just so tragic about all our lives that we lead. Every day is an ordinary day in our lives, but some days, unexpectedly, something completely, totally unexpected shatters your life, and that was one of those moments. June the 12th, 1972. One of the newest members of American Airlines fleet is in Detroit, Michigan. John, Paige. Flight 96, a brand new DC-10, is getting ready for takeoff. Captain Bryce McCormick and co-pilot Paige Whitney have been in the plane for hours. Back there, so when we're in flight, if you can get a chance just to look at that. Detroit is just a stopover on a flight from L.A. to Buffalo and then to New York. You you ready to try one, Page? All right, sir. McCormick has flown the plane out from California, but Whitney is going to fly the next leg. Both men want as much time at the controls as possible. Neither one of them has more than 75 hours flying the DC-10. Few pilots have more. There simply aren't enough of the planes in the air. In 1972, the DC-10 had just been introduced. The plane is the latest advance to passenger jets. Its style and its size set it apart from other airliners. The McDonnell Douglas Corporation has spent more than a billion dollars developing it. In the late 60s, there was a race going among the three major manufacturers of jetliners, uh, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, and Lockheed, to see who could get the, the first jumbo out. So they got really busy on getting this DC-10 in to production as fast as they could. And one of the things that they could not suffer were many delays based on some problem with the design. 
American Airlines is one of the first companies to buy the plane. Flight 96 is one of those planes. Just the fifth DC-10 ever built. Sidia Smith has just been trained to be the chief flight attendant on the DC-10. I was excited because it was the, one of the first jumbos that we had. And I was going to have the opportunity to fly number one, which is what I always wanted to do on a big jet. OK, you got it? Hand on the wheel. I got you. One, rotate. Just after seven in the evening, Flight 96 lifts off from Detroit Airport. Just minutes after takeoff, the plane is rising easily through 3,500 meters over Windsor, Ontario, Canada. I was sitting in my seat, and the captain had turned off the fasten seatbelt sign, and I was making my way to the galley, and I had to go sort of downhill because we were climbing to go to the galley to turn on the coffee. When I, when I punched the coffee and I moved over to one side, that's when it happened. I remember falling over because the plane was going, was like this, but all of a sudden it just went like this. I saw ceiling compartments fall, and I saw things coming out of pockets and everything, and I thought to myself, oh, boy. It, it felt like the last day of my life. We hit something. We lost an engine here. In the cockpit, the crew is fighting for control of their jet. The throttles which control the three engines have snapped to idle. The plane loses almost all its thrust. The huge jet begins slowing down. The plane immediately took a huge drop. And the next thing that happened was I was hit in the face with, with a piece of the plane. My husband was frantically trying to find a stewardess to give me something to pr put a pressure on my face to stop the bleeding. Let me have it! McCormick takes over control of the plane. He and Whitney wrestle the jet level. But Flight 96 has been badly damaged. Have we got hydraulics? No, I've got the full rudder here. The rudder on the tail, which controls the direction of the jet, is jammed to the right. That's forcing the plane to swing dramatically in that direction. While McCormick fights to turn his damaged plane back to Detroit, Sidia Smith is shocked to see a gaping hole in the floor of the main passenger cabin. People were asking me, you know, what to do, and I knew that I didn't know what to tell them. Smith has been able to account for all of her passengers. But flight attendant Sandra McConnell is missing. Sandra! Can you hear me? Sandra, where are you? And finally, I saw her come out of one of the bathrooms. McConnell has to cross the hole in the floor to move to safety. Almost 
almost every step she took, the floor kept collapsing. The crew brings up power to the engines on the wings. But the third engine on the tail stubbornly refuses to respond. Center, this is American Airlines Flight 96. We got an emergency. American 96, roger. Type of emergency? We got a jammed rudder. We need to get down and make an approach. Along with his engine and his rudder, McCormick is also having trouble controlling the elevators on the tail of the plane. They help him move the massive plane up and down. They're slow to respond, but he can move them. The situation isn't completely hopeless. I think it's going to fly! American 96, turn for the right, heading two, zero, zero. Without complete control of the elevators, and with a rudder that's frozen to the right, McCormick has to use his engines to turn the plane. By increasing the thrust on one side of the plane, he can change direction. But it won't be fast. I have no rudder control whatsoever. So our turns are gonna have to be very slow and cautious. All of the passengers move as far away from the hole in the back as possible. But apart from the cut to Loretta Kaminsky, so far there are no other serious injuries. landing. Bryce McCormick's DC-10 is badly damaged. The lives of everyone on board now depend entirely on his ability to land a plane that can barely fly. With explosive suddenness, a short flight from Detroit to Buffalo has become the most challenging flight of Captain Bryce McCormick's career. He's down an engine, and he can't move his rudder. As he heads back to Detroit, McCormick begins to slow his plane down so it can land safely. But when he does, his plane begins falling dangerously fast. Ideally, McCormick should be descending at 700 feet a minute. But now he's falling more than twice that fast. 1,600 feet per minute. What's the sink rate? Sink rate. 1,600! At this rate, McCormick will crash well short of the runway. He increases power to his engines to slow his fall. Sink rate 700. McCormick has slowed the plane's descent to 700 feet per minute. But to do that, he's had to increase his forward airspeed, which means he'll be landing far faster than usual. For the first time since the beginning of the crisis, McCormick talks to the passengers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We've had a small problem, but the plane is under control now, and we're heading back to Detroit for an emergency landing. Bryce McCormick was as calm as if he were welcoming you on the plane. As the plane nears the airport, flight attendants ask passengers to remove their shoes and any sharp pieces of jewelry. They had to take off their shoes and glasses. We collected everything in a, in a blanket. Less than half an hour after leaving, the badly damaged DC-10 struggles back to the Detroit airport. The few minutes that it took to get back to Detroit were the longest minutes that I will ever remember spending on an airplane, because we were sure that we were not going to survive. Captain Bryce McCormick now needs to give the jet even more power to push the nose up for landing. 
His plane is still drifting to the right and traveling fast. I have no rudder to straighten it out when it hits. The DC-10 with 67 people aboard roars toward the runway at almost 300 kilometers an hour. The landing was the most frightening part of the entire flight. When the plane hits the ground, it begins veering hard to the right. Once the plane landed, it seemed like we just went on forever. I mean, it was just forever. One set of landing gear wheels runs off the runway and through the grass. After a harrowing touchdown, the plane eventually comes to a stop just 300 meters from the end of the runway. Okay. Engines off at your discretion. Shut him down. Every woman wanted to hug him, and um, he was just amazing because we th it was just at that moment that we all realized that we were alive because of him, that he literally had saved our lives. If you take a look at something like this and you say, well, there's good flying and there's bad flying, this is beyond good, this is superlative, this is using every instinct you have as an airman and all the, all the capabilities you have to stay calm enough to get the situation assessed. With the plane on the ground, the crew has its first opportunity to inspect the damage. The captain and I walked back when everybody was off. We walked back to the um, back, and we just looked up and saw this hole. And it was just so weird. There's no indication that the jet hit something as the pilot's first thought. What has caused such damage to the airliner? The hole was so enormous that if anyone had been sitting in the seats that were there, they would have been sucked out immediately. At that point, they still felt it might have been a bomb. But while the incident had happened with explosive suddenness, no indication of a bomb is found. As investigators begin their work, they discover that not all of the DC-10 is at the Detroit airport. A coffin that the plane was carrying in its cargo hold is discovered 30 kilometers away from the Detroit airport, near Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Investigators also find the plane's rear cargo door. Doors are not supposed to fall off airplanes, especially since it was a rather new airplane. You would not expect some, something like that to happen. When they examine the cargo area of the plane, they discover that the very design of the door makes it a potential weak spot. These don't look like most doors on a jet open inward. In fact, the door is slightly larger than the frame it fits into. As the pressure builds inside a jet, this type of plug door is actually forced into the frame of the aircraft. The design makes the door extremely safe. But McDonnell Douglas designed the cargo door on the DC-10 to open outward. That decision was made to increase the amount of storage space on the plane. When it's closed, hooks on the DC-10's door grab hold of a bar on the plane's doorframe. To make sure it's closed, baggage handlers push down on a lever, which drives locking pins through the hooks, which hold them in place.
When investigators examined the cargo area of the plane, they don't find any structural damage around the door. When they study the locks on the cargo door itself, they find that the latches are not completely closed. And the pins that are supposed to make sure the door is locked are not in their locked position. When we interrogated the uh, cargo handler that closed the door, uh, it became immediately apparent that he used excessive force to close the door. And in fact, he said he had to use his knee to get the, the door handle to go flush. Investigators make a frightening discovery. It's possible to close the lever on the outside of the door, even if the hooks and locking pins are not in the closed position. Paul Eddy is a journalist who investigated the history of the DC-10. What Windsor showed is that you could actually pull the handle in order to buckle the top fixture so that the handle went home properly, but the locking pins had not gone through the spools. Engage the lever. This means that baggage handlers can believe the door is closed when it's not. Not only can the outside lever be closed without the locks being fully engaged, there's no way for the crew of the plane to know. The faulty locking pins will still turn off the warning light, even though they aren't in their proper position. The door was a ticking time bomb. As passenger jets climb, the difference between the pressure inside the plane and the pressure outside the plane grows. If a door isn't properly shut, it will blow out with explosive force. The problem on the American Airlines flight began as the plane passed through 3,500 meters. When the door blew, the coffin in the cargo hold was sucked out. When the air pressure inside the plane was released, anything that wasn't firmly attached was pulled out of the airliner. It's a really startling thing if you're not expecting it. What you've got is a lot of air stuffed inside this pressure vessel that now wants to get out. And the bigger the airplane is, the more powerful the hurricane of air leaving the airplane is during that period of time. By itself, explosive decompression does not make a plane unflyable. So why had Captain McCormick experienced such difficulties controlling his jet? Investigators take a closer look at the back of the plane's cabin and learn that the very design of the DC-10 makes it vulnerable. When the cargo door blew off, there was so much pressure on the floor of the cabin that it collapsed into the cargo compartment below. When it did, the floor ripped into some of the plane's critical control systems. When it collapsed the floor, it took the cables that controlled number two engine, and it took most of the cables, or impeded most of the cables that had to do with the flight controls in the back. I think it's going to fly! It left McCormick just enough control to keep his plane level. The remarkable flying of Bryce McCormick had saved the lives of everyone on board Flight 96. But there was a problem with one of the newest and most expensive planes flying over North America. In the Windsor incident, there was an obvious flaw. And that's where the NTSB said, look, here is really the smoking gun, the ability to close that thing without having all those locks engaged. Let's make sure we change this system right now. Every DC-10 operator needs to know this. Chuck Miller is the head of the NTSB's Aviation Safety Bureau. We have to check all the latches, OK? Every single latch. It's his responsibility to point out problems with the new DC-10 and propose solutions. He helps write the fixes he thinks McDonnell Douglas needs to make to keep the plane safe. He was a very, very professional man, and he had his, his investigators had enormous respect for him. 
Chuck didn't sit back at, in the office. Chuck was always on the scene. For Chuck Miller, fixing the DC-10 is a matter of professional pride. For McDonnell Douglas, the near accident over Windsor has enormous implications. Their billion-dollar gamble came close to tumbling from the sky. If anything else goes wrong, the company itself could be at stake. March the 3rd, 1974. A perfect spring-like day in Paris. It's been almost two years since a DC-10 came close to crashing near Windsor, Ontario. Now, more than 50 of the new planes are flying around the world. One of them, Plane 29, is owned by Turkish Airlines. Normally, the last leg of this trip from Turkey to England wouldn't be very crowded. But today, the DC-10 is filling up fast. People are squeezing into seats throughout the plane. A strike at a British airline has passengers scrambling for any flight back to London. Wendy Wheel is one of many last-minute additions to the flight. A model, she's returning home after a shoot in Spain. We'd been married for 18 months, and uh, we were about to start a family. I believe the secret of her success for, for modelling was not just that she was a very attractive girl um, and good model material, but she was generally liked by all the photographers because she had such a pleasing, lovely, light personality. With all the new passengers boarding, the flight is a little behind schedule. And it's not only the crew who are waiting. At the back of the plane is baggage handler Mohammed Mahmoudi. With all the new passengers, he's not sure if there are any more bags to load. Not expecting any other luggage, Mahmoudi locks the rear cargo door. The DC-10 is set to go. Just after 12.30 in the afternoon, THY Flight 981 lifts off into the skies above Paris. London is less than an hour away. Price control, this is Tango Hotel Yankee 981. We're at 60. Requesting clearance to flight level 230. Tango Hotel Yankee 981, you are cleared to flight level 230. 981, roger. As it flies away from the airport, the DC 10 continues to gain altitude. 2,700 meters, 3,000 meters, 3,300 meters. The huge jet shudders and banks to the left. Are you sure? Just 16 seconds after the start of the crisis, the crew struggles to save their crippled jet. The nose is pitching down, the plane picking up speed. Bring it up! Oh, no, no. I can't bring it up! She doesn't respond! 
passengers at the back of the plane witness a horrifying scene. Two rows of seats have simply disappeared. Through a huge hole in the floor, passengers can see the sky over France. 7,000 feet! Hydraulics! We've lost this! The crew discovers that they have no hydraulic power with which to control the plane. Without it, they can't move their rudder or elevators. Even without its most basic controls, the plane begins to level out. But it's fallen too far. Looks like we're going to hit the ground! Speed! The DC-10 is traveling almost 800 kilometers an hour. The flight from Paris to London never even makes it to the English Channel. Just nine minutes after taking off, Turkish Airways Flight 981 becomes the worst plane crash of all time. In London, the flight is listed as delayed. The news of the crash comes out slowly. I went to the uh, ticket office kiosk, and I s asked what has happened to the flight, and instantly the look on the gentleman's face behind the counter told me something was wrong, instantly. There's barely anything left here that's recognizable as being a part of an aircraft. I looked on the television and I just thought, well, I just hope she's dead, because I just saw the carnage of the forest in Sonlis, and it was like looking at the, a First World War trench movie. Flight 981, carrying 346 passengers, virtually disintegrates on impact. There are no survivors. It was just a scene of absolute, utter devastation. And it, the, the litter of personal possessions, electric wires, bits of metal, bits of bodies, just strewn everywhere. I mean, you couldn't walk. You couldn't walk anywhere without the, the danger you were going to stand on a part of a human being. I still have nightmares about this, even though it's 33 years ago. Investigators for the French Accident Investigation Bureau are quickly on the scene. My first job was to evaluate the scope of the wreckage and to begin the first investigation on the spot. At first, I was unable to know what has happened. I was just seeing that a terrible crash has occurred and that it will be a very hard uh, work for the investigators. Despite the enormous force of the crash, the black boxes, made of three layers of hardened steel and insulation, survive. Their contents could provide valuable clues about the crash. Most of the speculation was that it must have been a bomb because, you know, you've got an almost brand new, very powerful aeroplane flying in clear blue sky, and it gets to 12,000 feet and, fall, and falls out of it. Investigators are called to a field 15 kilometers from the crash site. They find a piece of fuselage and two rows of seats from the DC-10. Somehow, they fell free of the airliner before the rest of the plane smashed into the forest. When investigators arrive, the bodies of the passengers who were in the seats have already been removed. When relatives of those who died in the crash arrive in France, they're directed to a small church in the town of saint lys One of the saddest sights I've ever seen is in this church. They laid out on tables everything they'd found, you know, clothing, um, possessions, teddy bears, 
rings, watches. Um, and then relatives who wanted to were allowed to come and walk around these trestle tables with all this stuff like that. They produced a little packet with my wife's wedding ring and rings, engagement ring. It was all pretty battered up, so you could imagine the thoughts that went through my mind. Since the accident involves an American plane, the NTSB's Chuck Miller joins the investigation. For the second time in two years, he's dealing with a problem with the DC-10. I don't believe that Miller suspected for one moment that the door hadn't been fixed after Windsor. But it becomes clear that the piece of fuselage found in France is in fact the plane's rear cargo door. It seems like a repeat of the Windsor accident. Miller is left with a haunting question. Why hadn't the problem been fixed? When he saw the door, of course, saw that the, it, had, it hadn't been done, the fix hadn't been made. And that's when uh, I think his anger uh, became very, very strong indeed. Miller takes an unusual step. Although the official investigation is just beginning, he gives journalist Paul Eddy an important tip. I said, have you got any ideas what made the door come off? He said, yeah. Well, if I were you, I'd go and look at a place called Windsor, Ontario. Hello. I'm Chuck Miller. Miller shares his suspicions with the French investigators. Could you please pass these around? These were taken on June 12th, 1972, right after the incident. We have uh, asked for the report on the Windsor accident, and uh, our uh, American colleagues were also uh, volunteers to give us a lot of details. Now, we had an American Airlines flight from Detroit to Buffalo have its cargo door blow off. And he has been very frank, and I'll explain what he was thinking of the Windsor accident. After all the work done during the American Airlines investigation, had something been overlooked? Was there another problem with McDonnell Douglas's enormous plane? With the information from Chuck Miller, French investigators take a closer look at the plane's cargo door. They make a shocking discovery. There is no new problem. It's just like the American Airlines case all over again. The latches that are supposed to hold the cargo door closed aren't locked. And since two rows of seats were sucked out of the DC-10 over Paris, it's clear that the floor on the plane collapsed, just as it had in Windsor. In fact, when investigators listen to the cockpit voice recorder, they find that the Turkish flight crew had even less control of their plane than the crew of American Airlines Flight 96. We need to get down and make an approach. I think it's going to fly. Over Windsor, Bryce McCormick was able to recover his plane and land it. But in Paris, all the hydraulic systems were destroyed. Hydraulic! We've lost it! The hydraulic fluid helps crews move the rudder and elevators on the tail. Not being able to control them meant the crew couldn't keep their plane in the sky. 
basic problem was the Paris flight was much heavier in terms of the number of people on board. The, uh, the floor, when it collapsed, collapsed with such a tremendous amount of pressure that it literally severed all the cables and control to the back. They had no hope after that point. You and each of you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about Shortly after the crash of Turkish Airlines Flight 981, Chuck Miller is back in the United States. Our first witness this morning is Mr. C.O. Miller, Director of the Bureau of Aviation Safety of the NTSB. This time, he's facing questions from American senators. A potentially catastrophic design defect. A special hearing begins to find out how a problem that was identified in 1972 could bring another plane down two years later. Of course, our understanding up to this time, they all had been. What you've got to now discover is why wasn't that door fixed? Why would a major, venerable, mighty American corporation deliberately do something like this? Less than a month after the near crash over Windsor, the NTSB had made two very specific recommendations. Miller and his investigators recommended that a change be made to the locking mechanism. Engage the lever. They wanted to make sure that it was physically Here's impossible for baggage Light handlers to close the lever without the locking pins being in place. They also suggested that vents be put into the floors of all DC-10s. This would rapidly allow the pressurized cabin air to equalize without collapsing the floor. But in the two years since the accident, Neither one of these recommendations was implemented. There is a fundamental problem at the heart of aviation safety, and that has been in the United States for a very long time, and that is that it's the job of the NTSB to discover what's happened uh, and to, to come up with recommendations as to how to prevent it happening again, but it has absolutely no authority to implement them. The NTSB does not have regulatory authority. They have to turn to the FAA, as they did, and say, we want these things done. And that's where the system went wrong. If the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, issues an airworthiness directive, planes are pulled out of service until the proper fix is made. But as serious as the problems on the DC-10 were, no airworthiness directive was ever issued. A so-called gentleman's agreement between the head of the FAA and the head of McDonnell Douglas stopped it from happening. The gentleman's agreement is the root cause of Paris. There is no question that if an airworthiness directive had been issued, as it should have been after Windsor, Paris would not have happened. It was an entirely avoidable accident. McDonnell Douglas assured the FAA that it would fix the problem voluntarily. An airworthiness directive would cast a shadow on the still-fledgling DC-10. The last thing in the world you want is for the public or any of the airlines who are going to be operating these airplanes to think, uh oh maybe there's some flaws in this bird. And so an airworthiness directive, especially one that requires you to go back and re-engineer something, is a really horrific thought for a manufacturer. McDonnell Douglas did make changes to the way the cargo door was built. A peephole was cut in the bottom of the door, so baggage handlers could see if the locking pins had engaged. Several warning signs were also attached to the plane's door. The company also made other changes to the DC-10. These included increasing the length of the locking pins and attaching a plate to the inside of the door. This plate would make it physically impossible to push down the lever if the door wasn't properly locked. But each of the proposed fixes had its own problem. Many baggage handlers didn't know what the small window in the door was for. And the baggage handler in Paris read and spoke three languages, but not English, the only language in which the warning signs were written. The support plate that was supposed to be installed in the door was never attached to the jet that crashed in Paris. Papers confirming the completion of the work are also uncovered. But no matter what the paper trail says, the fix was never made. 
Again, the problem is you don't have an independent FAA inspector coming along to, set, to look and see it and then put his stamp on it because it wasn't an airworthiness directive. In the years following the Turkish Airlines crash, an enormous flurry of lawsuits are filed in California. The tragic story of the DC-10 has one more surprise in store. It's 1974, and an unprecedented series of lawsuits are being filed against McDonnell Douglas. The families of those who died near Paris want someone held responsible. As time went by, I learned more and more about what actually happened and realized that it was not an accident as we would call an accident. It was totally avoidable. My goal was to expose these people. In the weeks leading up to the trial, lawyers who are involved in the case have access to the entire history of the DC-10's development. They're not the only ones who pour through the evidence. So does journalist Paul Eddy. We were determined to get to those documents and that testimony. Somebody gave us a key to the depository where the documents were, and, and so at night we would go in and then had a huge accumulated pile of, of documents to go through in order to find out what they've been up to. Reading through the immense pile of paper, Eddie makes an incredible discovery. A memo written by Don Applegate, the director of product engineering for Convair, the company who'd built the cargo door for McDonnell Douglas. I think the point when we knew we got them was the Applegate memorandum that specifically pre-warned this, this would happen. The memo is a damning indictment of the cargo doors that were being made for the DC-10 and the lack of venting in the cabin floors. It warns that it's only a matter of time before there's a major disaster involving the doors. The airplane demonstrated an inherent susceptibility to catastrophic failure when exposed to explosive decompression of the cargo compartment. The memo, written just weeks after the near disaster in Windsor, recommends that immediate changes be made to the DC-10 cargo door. You know you've got them. You know you've got them, because you know they knew. During the court case, another chilling find is made. Not only did McDonnell Douglas know about the problem after Windsor, they knew during the development of the DC-10. Four years before the Paris crash, two years before Windsor, the cargo door failed during a pressure test. The company knew there was a problem, but the fundamental design of the door stayed the same. I could not believe a large corporation, McDonnell Douglas at the time, could do such a thing, could risk our lives, ordinary people's lives, for the sake of money. Well, in aviation, it's called tombstone technology. In other words, we always have the balance of money. And unfortunately, over the years, it has been true more times than not that we have had to wait until we had enough people die in an accident to say, you know, we really are going to have to spend the money over here. The Applegate memo and other information that comes out during the court case leads to one of the biggest settlements in the history of aviation. McDonnell Douglas paid over $80 million in damages. After the Paris crash, foolproof changes were finally made to the DC-10 cargo door. And this time, nothing was left to chance. The FAA issued an airworthiness directive that ensured the doors would never again open in midair. 
and it worked. After Paris, there wasn't another serious incident involving the cargo doors on a DC-10. But the plane's history and an intensely competitive industry did have an impact. McDonnell Douglas sold far fewer commercial DC-10s than it had once hoped for. Most of the pilots that I know who have flown the DC-10 over the years really love the old bird. She's probably a little more clunky than the 747 in terms of her heaviness of flight controls, but it's still a lovely bird to fly. That's fine, but you can't disassociate either the, either the airplane or the company from the awful reputation that the crash left. Eventually, McDonnell Douglas itself disappears. The company was bought by Boeing in 1996. In the forest outside Paris, a monument now stands honoring those who were killed on Flight 981. A permanent reminder of one of the most disturbing crashes in the history of aviation. You never forget. And I've gone on to lead uh, my life for 30 odd years, but I've never forgotten. People to this day think it was an accident, and it wasn't.